Hey guys, it's Alex. Today we're talking about what's going on in the Victoria, BC real estate market as we come into 2023. I want to take you on a bit of a walk and talk, unpack some of the stats from the last few months, and talk a little bit more about what I'm expecting as we transition into what I feel is the biggest test for our real estate market this year, the spring market, and what could be a big influx of inventory. Whether demand keeps up remains to be seen, but I want to talk through some of those variables that are affecting things moving forward and what we might learn from that with respect to whether this is the bottom or not, uh, where we're at. There definitely has been a big sentiment shift over the last few months and weeks even, and it feels like activities picked up. The stats don't necessarily tell that story, but I want to layer in a little bit of anecdotal evidence to tell you about what's going on on the ground here and how it might affect your decision in 2023. Now, before we get out on the streets, I want to layer in a few bits of data here to give you some context for some of the themes that I'm going to touch on. Point number one, although that single family detached median across our board is down by 20% from the highs, which were 1.325 back in March of last year and a million 60 today, they've been relatively flat since last October. The benchmark data is slowly catching up to that median figure and it's down 14.1% from the highs across our board and 14.5% for single family homes in the core neighborhoods. Because condo prices are a touch lower, that median value has been protected a little bit more than in single family and is just down 15.3% from the highs. The peak median sale price that we saw was 620,000 in February of 2022, and that fell all the way to 550 this past July and has been relatively flat since coming to 525 at present. One of the factors helping to support prices is the fact that our absorption rate has been stuck between 20 to 30% since last July. Basically, we're just not getting enough listing inventory to tip the scales in favor of buyers. March through June is the busiest four month stretch for new listing inventory on our board. And in the last five years, we've averaged just over 5,200 listings in that four month span. Consider that for an entire calendar year, the five year average is just above 12,000 new listings. And lastly, the stats don't tell us how competitive it actually feels on the ground for people that are buying and selling currently because a greater share of the sales, although they are limited, are competitive. Of the 270 some odd sales that occurred in January, 86 of them happened with a property being listed for two weeks or less. If we look back to November of last year, it was a similar finger of 88 sales, but that came from 370 total sales for that month. So a greater share of the total sales are happening quickly. So we put all these data points together and the picture is still a little bit cloudy. We're coming off the third worst January in sales volume since 1990, previous low in 2009. Although at that time, there was more than twice the amount of listed inventory. The other piece of the inventory story is the fact that there's not a lot of quality inventory. So although the stats tell us there's more than 1,700, it feels like there's a lot less on the ground. Uh, that's, of course, what I tried to highlight with the increased competition level and pace of some of those sales that are transacting. A bigger slice of them are transacting quickly because there's not a lot of quality and there are buyers out there that are sitting and waiting on product. I experienced this a few times myself in January. I was in multiple offers with clients hoping to secure properties in desirable neighborhoods that were appropriately priced. Anything that falls in that category right now, there's a good chance there's someone else that's sitting and waiting, but those buyers are showing up. In my view, a big reason why those buyers are showing up is because there's been an infusion of confidence back into the Canadian real estate market and a notable sentiment shift in the last few weeks and months. Things like Tiff Macklin coming out and telling us that they're going to pause and evaluate over the next little while, Jerome Powell and the Fed coming out quite dovish in their last presser and only raising by 25 basis points, capital markets ripping as a consequence of that. People watching that five-year government bond yield tick down below 3% for the first time in a while, which could signal that those five-year fixed rates are headed into the mid fours. We're seeing them now in the high fours, and I think that that's given people the confidence to think, you know what, I think the worst is now behind us. 2022 obviously was the Jekyll and Hyde of real estate markets in Victoria, BC and in Canada. We went from peak optimism in the early spring, February, March of last year to peak pessimism almost overnight. And obviously those significant price drawdowns on a month over month basis put a lot of fear in buyers' minds and caused people to say, you know what, I'm gonna wait this out and see how it plays out. 
I will say that it definitely does feel like we've reached a bit of a stability point. Maybe we're just in the eye of the storm and the worst is ahead of us. Maybe there are a few variables that could push things that much lower. Uh, deep recession, job losses, people being forced to give up their homes. Obviously, I cannot predict that. But I will say that if inflation begins to roll off as expected, if the Bank of Canada holds, if those fixed rates start to drop, I mean, we're still in a really elevated rate environment. And the caveat to all this is that I don't think things are going to flip in the other direction either. I do expect 2022 to be a slow and sluggish year in real estate. But once we get into the spring, which I will consider the ultimate test for our market this year, are we going to see that absorption rate dip below 20%? Could we end up in a situation where we have less than 600 sales and more than 3,000 active listings? Absolutely. Does that mean that we're going to slide another 10% down from here? I don't think so, but there probably could be a touch more downside to come. Another news item that I'm trying to keep track of are new OSFI regulations that could be coming down the pipeline. These are the same folks that introduced the stress test a number of years ago to mitigate rapid changes in interest rates. Basically, they're talking about a new loan to income requirement that would affect all big banks and probably at some point credit unions and private lenders um, to say that you can only borrow four and a half times what you make. Now, again, at this stage, it's all just being proposed and until it actually comes into effect, will not have an impact. But what I might expect is that if that does get adopted, announced and implemented, there could be a seesaw effect. What I mean by that is there could be a rush of buyers that try to get into the market before those changes are implemented after it's announced. And once it is implemented, there could be a shrinking of the buyer pool based on that new regulation. That's just another one of those things that I'm going to keep track of over the next few months. I'll be sure to keep you all informed as developments affect our real estate market as we head toward what I feel is the biggest test moving forward, the spring market. It's going to be really interesting times. Unfortunately, January and February, I don't think will give us as much data as we need to be able to accurately predict what's going to happen. But once we get into March, April and May, it'll definitely be interesting to keep you updated on what's going on and how it's affecting our market in 2020. 23.